It's been six months since I had my injury and my surgery on the hamstring. Okay, take two. It's been about six months since my injury at the Olympics and since my surgery. It's been about six months since my injury at the Olympics. It's been six months since my injury. It's been about six months. I had about six months. Been about six months. Six months. Six months. So it's been about six months since my injury at the Olympic Games and my subsequent surgery. And I've been laying low ever since, sort of because I needed space to work through what happened. And also because if I'm honest, I wasn't really feeling a lot of love for the sport for quite a while. On the positive side though, I have been training for four months. Um, this rehab has been going quite well. I haven't had a single week where I had to take steps back and I've been progressively getting better. Um, it is a very long road though, I'm not sprinting yet, although I'm getting very close. So hopefully in the next few weeks I'll be picking up sprinting, more jumping, um, and then I'll be able to put everything together in time to be ready for the World Championships in July and the European Championships in August. Uh, so those two are still my big goals. I'm not sure whether I'll be posting a lot on social media in the next few months, but if I find the time, if I find the motivation, then I will be putting out all my thoughts, all my experiences from this rehab uh, somewhere later this year. But for now, I'm gonna keep my head down. I'm gonna stay focused on this rehab and just try to be the best that I can be. Um, and then I hope I will see you this summer. So after the injury, I didn't talk to the press and I didn't post anything on my social media. And I realized, okay, it's been six months now. It's high time that I update the world on what has been going on. And I came back from Belgium and I recorded this video. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, so I'm talking about how well things are going, about how my body's responding well and how it looks like I'm going to be on track to make it this summer. It sounds like I'm jinxing it. And unfortunately, I'm pretty sure I jinxed it because launching that video marked the start of a much more challenging period. I remember doing that exact session. I was doing 100 meter repeats and I built them down to about 13 seconds, which felt really good at the time. It was my fastest yet. And it felt like I was getting quite close to getting that sprinting feeling back. And this was the exact same day I posted that update video. And the day after I got to the track and my hamstring was sore and sensitive. And we didn't want to take any risks. So we moved the session to the next day. And the next day I came back and it felt the same. And quickly I started thinking, okay, did I maybe push it too much? Did I hurt it again without me realizing it? But I went to the physios and they couldn't feel anything either. There was no swelling, there was no tension, there was no tightness. So we figured it wasn't the body sending a warning signal, it was actually the body healing again. Either the nerves were now healing properly and so they were more sensitive and tender, or it was the tissue around the injured area that was now becoming stronger and bigger, so it was creating more friction and tension around that injured area. Whatever it was, I was now a warned man and I made sure that I was always warming up properly and paid extra care to that hamstring. <laughs> And 
And we were heading into a very interesting period. I had sort of finished that big rehab block of general work, but we were trying to move towards more specific track work and especially sprinting. And sprinting is the hardest thing that you can do for your hamstring. So it's easy to see that you can't just go from this general work to max out sprinting. There needs to be sort of a transition period so that your body gets used to the forces that it'll see during those sprints. And so there were a few aspects that we needed to work on. And one was specific strength. And I was doing a lot of accelerations, slowly building up the speed. We were doing a lot of banded resistance work. So my brother would hold me back and I would accelerate through that resistance so that I could, in a controlled way, build the tension on my hamstring. There was also a lot of general strength work to do. Um, we were doing a lot of squats and step ups and leg curls and all those things to make sure that my body was strong enough. But there is another important factor that still needed quite a lot of work and that is flexibility. Because sprinting is this big, powerful motion and you need to be able to go through that full range of motion without pushing the limits of your flexibility. And since the surgery, I hadn't fully regained my original flexibility. So wherever I was, whatever I was doing, I was always trying to get some sort of stretch in, whether I was at home or in the pool or watching TV or even at the beach. I was always trying to do some form of stretching because it was very important for me to regain my full range of motion going into events like sprints and long jump and pole vault. And of course, it wouldn't be decathlon if there weren't a whole lot of events happening at the same time. And while I was building this base for sprint work, I was also reintroducing hurdles. So started very slow, low hurdles, very close together and just kind of building it as we went along and the feeling in the hurdles was quite good. I was afraid that I would struggle because hurdles is, is fairly intense and you need that range of motion to bring your trail leg around. But actually it wasn't too much of an issue. Uh, we also reintroduced 1500 meter work. And for the first time in my career, I think I was quite excited to start uh, doing this event again because it was the first event where you kind of hit race pace almost straight away in training. So it really feels like your first step towards competing again. And then for high jump, I had already done quite a bit of work on the basketball court. I had already done scissor jumps on the high jump pit, but we still needed to make the transition to Fosbury flop. And this was a pretty interesting one. I'm about to do my first high jump session back in the Fosbury flop. And uh, I'm scared shitless. I don't know why. It's like I completely forgot what Fosbury flop even is. Like, I don't know how, how do I land on my back and not strain my hamstring? Um, yeah, uh, makes no sense. Let's see how this goes.
that first session was beyond bizarre. I don't know why, but for some reason I had this weird mental block that I forgot how to clear the bar with my back. And after forcing myself through a few jumps, it gradually started coming back. And from there, things went very quickly. I did like any year, I take my warm up to the basketball court. And the reason I do that is because it's so simple. I don't have to focus on technique or rhythm or a bar clearance. All I have to do is I look at the rim and I try to dunk the ball. And after I've done a few jumps on the basketball court, I take it to the track, I put a bar on, I add the rhythm and the technique, and that just makes for really efficient and good training sessions for me. So after a few weeks, I was back to clearing 1 meter 95 and seeing where all the other events were at, this was really, really motivating. With the increase in intensity came the first few issues, and most notably, my knee. In all the medical checkups up until that point, they had told me that except for the bone bruise, they couldn't see anything wrong with the knee. But as the intensity increased, clearly there was something wrong. My knee joint was way too flexible, I could move my tibia plateau around, which it shouldn't do. And this wasn't as much an issue for impact or when there was tension on my leg, but when the motion was free, like a swing in the high jump or when your back leg in a sprint moves forward, it was giving me a lot of issues. And at this point, most of my time was spent trying to warm up my knee and trying to loosen it up so that I could get through the training sessions. And I was at this annoying point where, you know, if I did the right things, if I stuck to the right intensity, I would be able to get through a training session. If I made a small mistake or I triggered it too much, then I would have to cut it short. And, and because of that, I could never let go. Every waking moment was now spent focusing on that knee so that it would be good for the next training session. And this had already been going on for three, four weeks and I was about to start sprinting again. And all I wanted was for my knee to feel good so that I could just get back to proper training. But instead of me telling you how frustrating this whole period was, my girlfriend was there throughout all of it. And because she's in South Africa, I wasn't able to properly interview her for this series. But what we can do is give her a call. Hello, Lise. Hello, boyfriend. How are you doing? I'm working on episode four, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a mission I'm not getting through. What do you remember? I remember it was just after your six month updates saying that everything was going well and there was a smooth rehab and you know that it's not always like that. But <laughs> I remember, you know, when your, your hamstring and your knee started hurting and just come, trying to, you know, keep going, but come, like figure out what it was. Because we went to the doctor, the doctor suggested some things. Frantra checked it out. Chris checked it out. It wasn't anything specific or, you know, something. You had to figure it out on your own, which also meant that you were thinking about it a lot. And no matter what we did or where we were, you were touching your knee or doing a weird stretch or, you know, um, yeah, but it was tricky and you're starting to sprint again, which also kind of felt like one step forward, two steps back. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. So today is the first sprint training. I'm gonna put my spikes on for the first time and then I'm gonna do everything as easily and as calmly as possible because uh, it's easy to lose your head and like feel good and go for it the first session which would probably not be good for my hamstring so i'm just going to take it easy i'm going to do a few starts a few speed drills um at 60 meters and then maybe a little bit longer depending on how i feel um, but so first speed session everything easy everything calm 
see how everything feels and how the hamstring reacts. Um, but it's nice to actually finally get the spikes back on and uh, have, you know, at least the feeling that things are progressing. So, first sprint session, let's go. Was the most frustrating for Thomas in this process of getting back into the sprints was that he could build up to around 95% of his maximum and then his knee would start to act up and so we needed to figure out uh, not only how much rest he needed but also with the physios with what treatment he needed um, and so it was a long process of going forward and backward and trying to get get him sprinting above that 95% without getting a lot of reaction on the knee and it basically didn't happen for a couple of weeks and so I could see with Thomas he was starting to wonder is this gonna work because I'm trying so hard but every time that I try to push it a little bit further I take two steps back. So today is a, an important sprinting day. Uh, I haven't been able to sprint properly at all so far. I've done a few sessions where I did some submaximal sprinting, but I've been struggling with my knee and that's been sort of keeping me from sprinting at full speed. And we were about three months from the world champs and I haven't done a single proper sprint session. So it's really important that I start doing those. So I've gotten a few days off. I've been taking care of my knee, trying to get it loose and relaxed so that I can at least do this sprint session. So this is for this week, the only really important training session. Um, the only focus of this week is because I really have to get the ball rolling on speed. Otherwise I won't be ready in three months for Oregon. So it's a little bit stressful because this knee is just not letting up at the moment. So today, straight focus, just the sprinting. I need to get this work in because I need time to have my muscles adapt, especially my hamstring, to this kind of intensity because otherwise I'll get to a decathlon and I'll be able to maybe do a sprint but I won't be able to recover from it, I won't be able to go to the 400 and into the hurdles relaxed on day two, so this is an important session. So all the focus is on this and on keeping my knee as healthy as possible and hopefully it's a good session because I really need one. <laughs> I remember there was this one session where we had just taken a week off to let the knee rest and then on the week after mm -hmm. that I was supposed to focus only on the sprint session so everything else had to be as yeah. minimal as possible and I had to be fresh and my knee had to be yeah, recovered for that sprint session and the first sprint I could feel yep my knee's not good it's not there and it was just <laughs> all this <laughs> anticipation and putting everything on the back burner for like mm -hmm. a whole week so that I could do this one session, which at this point was not even that much. It was like two times 40, one times 60, one times 120, something like that. That was all <laughs> I could do. And I put a whole week of training on the back burner for this yeah. one session. And I didn't even get through my f first 40. And I was so destroyed. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I, I remember that was the, the first day where I, felt like quitting like i did not want to do that anymore at the same time we were trying to figure out his sprint capabilities we also needed to reintroduce the long jump and this was not an easy one because we didn't want 
to get them to the long jump pit and kind of make it a, a real training and focus on performance or trying to get back. Uh, our approach was much more like in the basketball. It was just you, you get to the sand pit and you are free to do whatever jump. The only thing that we want is that you land in the sand, get out of it, and you do it a couple of times over and over again. So those were kind of the first steps were free training. And from there on, we could slowly figure out, okay, can he do one-legged jumps? Can he uh, introduce a little bit more speed? Can he jump up higher in the air, jumping forward? Uh, kind of a playful approach. Uh, rather than to have like a performance mindset. That's how you learn. Yes. <laughs> that's actually that's a lot of fun. <laughs> I had actually already snuck in a few jumps before I started those training sessions. Uh, a few times after one of my training sessions, I would kind of sneak over to the long jump pit and do a few jumps, very casually, not making a big fuss about it, because I didn't want to build this anticipation towards my first training session. Um, you know, back to the, sp the spot where you hurt yourself. I just wanted to keep it relaxed and easy so I could progressively get into the long jump again. And those first few sessions were pretty uneventful. Those kind of low speed jumps come very natural to me. So muscle memory kicked in and straight away I was feeling fairly good on the runway. Hey. Hey. To be able far enough for worlds. Be 550. <laughs> How are you feeling? Uh, yeah, hamstring's a bit tight from sprinting on Wednesday. A few issues did pop up. My ankle was still quite sore when I was jumping, so clearly I had to take that back into the gym and rehab it harder than I had done before. And my knee was still sore. Just like in the sprints, it just felt like it was dragging all the time. And luckily it was still very low intensity, so it didn't bother me too much. But still, it was always in the back of my mind. And the only thing I really remember from these first few sessions is that the first time I put on spikes, I was at about six steps, very low speed. I was jumping about five meters 80, so really <laughs> nothing to write home about. And I got home after that session and I just started feeling drained and heavy. There was definitely something weighing on me. Oh. Okay. It's good enough for the first time. Reaching machine? Oh? Reaching. Okay. Yeah. The real challenge would be when I would add speed and then add intensity because I was afraid that I would never have the same conviction that I had before Tokyo. Before Tokyo, when I was on a long jump run up, I just gave my all. Every single jump, it was balls to the wall. Being on the long jump run-up felt like 100 meters to me. I wasn't holding back anything. And I was afraid that I would never have that conviction again. That I would always have this voice in the back of my head going, you know, I'd be careful if I were you. You never know what happens. Um, yeah, I was afraid that from now on I would always play it kind of safe. You know, after such a long process to get to the Olympics, to have the injury, to do the rehab, of course, these questions would come up like, you know, it's my last few years. Why am I doing this? It wasn't a question like before when you had cancer. <clears throat> like everything that I've heard about that time was that it wasn't really a question. You just keep going. Whereas now it was, yeah, do I really want to? And that definitely showed. Though, even with that said, even with like the decline in motivation, you still would get up and still go to the track um, and do what you need to do, which is something that not many of us do. Okay, fine, obviously not on the track, but not many of us do in our lives. You know, if if so much is kind of going wrong. We just kind of take it as a sign to walk away. So I completely understand like those questions. That's the decathlon mindset. If you get hit by a car and you're like, 
all casted up like literally every bone in your body but your fingers free you would still be <laughs> doing finger exercises in case you you make a comeback for shot put <laughs> I feel like that's actually a very, I can actually see you do that. I'd be wiggling my toes, being like, in case I make a comeback, you know, yes. for the long jump. <laughs> this has been a year unlike any other for me. Not only was there a physical recovery to go through, there was a lot of mental stuff to work through. More than ever, there were questions about the role of sports and performance in my life. The accident in Tokyo had truly shook the tree and had left a trail of questions begging to be answered. And with the struggle with my knee, these questions were all coming back with a vengeance. I had been hyper-focused on my knee, zooming in on it like it was a math or a physics problem, throwing every treatment and every exercise at it that I could imagine in an attempt to keep the quality of my training high enough so that I could make it to the world championships. But in early April, I had had enough. I could feel that I had been focused for too long, that I was losing the big picture, so I needed to take a step back and recharge. So we set off for the Cedarburg, which is a rocky region about 200 kilometers from Cape Town and one of my favorite places on this planet. It is barren and beautiful during the day and it is enchanting and mysterious at night with the Milky Way stretching from horizon to horizon it is just amazing. And it is also very rich in Bushman history. There's cave art all over the place. And it is the only place where I've consistently experienced true silence. And this time we didn't explore it by car. We actually took our bikes. So with our bike and our tents, we headed on the road. We slept under the stars or in caves. And it was just an amazing time and an amazing place to recharge. Mm -hmm. 